right, all right. Hello, everybody. Welcome on in. It's super, super good to finally be streaming Echo again. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to be continuing uh, Leo's route, which is our big boy Wolf. And uh, let me see if we can get Facebook open to say, give you guys a proper hello. <gasps> there it is. There it is. There's the dump leper. There's the dump leper that you guys all know. Right. The black ball comes you. <laughs> ah, dump leper. But yeah, we're going to be continuing this game today. I actually um, thought about uh, playing uh, uh, Winds of Change first, but then I saw this super, super beautiful piece of art that uh, was drawn of Leo. Let me pull it up. Look at that. This is beautiful. I absolutely love it. That is the main reason why we're going back to Leo's route because like literally I was thinking of the other day just thinking of going back to Leo's route and then uh, this pops up on my thread and I'm like okay you know what we got to do it we need to go back to Leo because I miss the boy too I miss him he Leo is my waifu <laughs> playthrough is so fun to watch right like i'm super glad that you guys are enjoying it too <coughs> oh excuse me but yeah i i've been enjoying this a lot and you know just like the music that's playing right now this is for the credits for the echo theme which is a remix version of the theme that they use in game so that is also super cool okay but yeah we're gonna be continuing Echo today, and Leo, as much as I heck and love you, buddy, you gotta get off my screen. <laughs> but yeah, let's continue this with a classic blepper outro. Wow. Classic blepper look. Okay, let me get uh, Echo up and running, and then we can begin. this game one and a half months ago and I still can't stop thinking about it right like this game is an absolute treasure I I love it so much okay let me turn down the volume a tad bit Okay, hopefully that's good. And you guys can hear and you guys can hear me clearly. I think maybe like halfway on the desktop audio is good. Okay, yeah. So um also t yesterday I learned that this game was in development for 6 years. 6 years. Like this is incredible. Like I actually went back and looked at like some of the older builds of the game that I got from screenshots, and like some of the characters, like uh, like Jenna and Leo and uh, and Flynn, they they look really different. I don't have their sprites yet. I don't think I actually have the sprites, but they they all look really different compared to what the, this build looks like. But still, six years of development—that is incredible. And I'm so happy that they finished this. But they did say that there are going to be new patches coming out very soon. So, yeah, without further ado, let's continue down Leo's route. There's a big hunky waff. <laughs> okay, he was on his way to the west coast, and once he thought he found the right train, he attempted to board it. No one knows exactly whatever happened, yet somehow his train went. Hope. 
His train to Hopin went horribly wrong, and he was found with both limbs severed two hours later. He managed to crawl 20 yards north up the rail before he was found. Somehow, and possibly, he survived the ordeal up to that point. This is mainly due to the mud packs that had been placed on the stumps, halting the bleeding. Of note was the fact that Robert had seemingly become delirious because of the blood loss, pain, or trauma. Likely a combination of all three, actually. He claimed that the bleeding had stopped by a creature of some kind. When he tried to describe it, he began to sob and scream incoherently. It's hard to say how much of this is, is being exaggerated by the author. Either way, I don't exactly have time to track down all her sources, so I just decided that I'll have to trust it. My leg jumps as something soft and ticklish brushes up against it. I snap my gaze up at Leo. What? Leo gives me an innocent look while he continues to brush up his tail up against my leg. Well, if you're not going to say anything, then please stop doing that. It's distracting. He does stop, and I feel a little guilty, so I look back up. And thanks for getting that library card, just so I can check this out. It's a huge help. He smiles. <laughs> no problem, Nutria. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. <laughs> not, not one of your sexier words. I return back to the book. It's unlikely that Robert would have survived anyway due to the extent of his injuries and infection. Still, it is of note that he ended up committing suicide a few hours after discovery. He apparently slipped out of the fifth floor window of the Payton Regional Medical Center. The authorities simply dismissed it as a case of a man knowing his demise was nigh and finishing the job himself. The author speculates it had something to do with the horrors he saw on the tracks. I hear a soft whine coming in front of me, and I lower, lower the book to find Leo draped across the table on his chest. He's looking up at me with huge puppy eyes. I can't help but smile because it's so fucking adorable, even for a wolf as big as him. What? I have a project to do, remember? Yeah, I know, but we've been here for three hours now. You should take a break. I look at him. I look at the time, and I'm shocked that he's actually right. How the hell did that even happen? Well, I guess that's a good idea. I was just finding some really interesting stuff. Well, I'm, sorry, I'm sure that project of yours is going to turn out awesome. He grins and stands up abruptly, grabbing my book up as well so I couldn't continue to read. Hey, let's go get some lunch. It's already almost three. Alright, did you want to go to the diner? You want to eat there? Well, it's been a few days. I like to catch up with the others, you know. I know it's like what you wanted to do. Actually, everyone's busy. I already tried. Oh, really? What are they doing? Well, Flynn's working, TJ and Jen are on a hike, and Carl's asleep. Oh. It doesn't really seem like Leo to just blow off a meeting with everyone. But I guess at this point in the trip, he's just tired of trying. I know I would be. Probably just to show me up after what I said last night, Leo takes me to a semi-fancy steakhouse. He, of course, insists on paying for everything. I'm not really sure when Leo became so concerned with how I perceive his income. I don't mind it though. The meal is good, and I'm not happy to, and I'm happy to not to pay the thirty-dollar price tag. It does remind me of his job though, so I ask him about, about his schedule. He says his parents gave him the entire week off, which surprises me. I remember how Leo worked almost every day in that shop. I guess his dad is just mellowing out with the age. Again, I have no reason to complain though. On the on the way back, Leo nudges me as I'm nodding off and gestures out his window. Paid in high. Sure enough, our old school is visible out in the window. Want to swing around? Just to look at it? Yeah. I'm tired, but we're not doing anything else. Alright, why not? Uh, Sparky, if you cannot say that, uh, that kind of makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, this we're playing Echo, but please don't say that. That. Mm. Yeah, that 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 kind of makes me uncomfortable, buddy. Yeah, it, it, it's okay, I guess. All right, we'll we'll continue on. It's past five at this point, as if we pull up into the parking lot, there are only a few cars scattered around. We'll walk around the side of the school, then onto the football field. If Payton High School puts its money anywhere else, it's definitely sports. This is one of the reasons I was so mediocre by comparison. Every sport in the school was extremely competitive, each one winning state regularly. 
They went state again since they've been gone. Nope, came close last year though. Almost as close as we did back in 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 nine. Uh, yeah, you still sore about that? Leo sits down on the top bench of the concrete bleachers, and I sit down next to him. Sometimes, mostly because we're so damn close, and it just really feels like it was yesterday. It kind of does feel like that. Eh, it kind of does feel that way. I can remember it pretty clearly. It was one of the few times I'd seen Leo actually really cry. He wanted that championship so bad. I lean back and look around, breathing in deeply. Wow, it's really nostalgic being here. Isn't it? Leo looks off towards the sunset, and I can see him getting glassy-eyed. Is it weird that if I could go through high school again? I think for a moment. You see? Listen to that. Hold on. I want you guys to listen to this. I love this game. I love, I love, I freaking love this theme to bits. Like, I wish that um, the developers of Echo could like release a soundtrack for this. Cause I don't know if this is a, like a royalty free music. It probably is, but <sighs> like this theme at least. And then that, the lo-fi remix of it. I need it. I need it. I think for a moment. Not really. I'd like to do it. I made a lot of mistakes. Well, not really because of that. More like it was a lot of fun. I just want to experience it all again. I grin at him. Hey, you're talking like you peaked in high school. Did I? The question catches me completely off guard and my stumbling around for words that doesn't follow help. That follow doesn't help. N n no. He sighs. Leo, you've got a good paying job, your own house, and a pretty damn good life. You're doing better than most. He laughs a little. <laughs> I guess I just don't feel like it, you know? Why not? He leans back. Well, I don't really feel as good as I did back then. When I think of high school or even further back. Man, those were the good days. I think about how completely inverse I am to that. How my life improved exponentially after I left the town. Well, you know, if you keep looking back, I don't think you'll ever be happy. <gasps> oh, we got one of the scenes! He looks so sad. I wrap an arm around his shoulders, which is a little difficult considering how broad they are. Because five years from now, you'll probably look back on this era of your life and think, Man, I wish you could go back. <laughs> You're probably right. This is my favorite freaking scene right now. Out of every scene that we've seen right now, I can press H. Wait, can I? <gasps> oh my god. This makes everything. Th this game is full wallpaper material. It's not even funny. This is my favorite scene right now. Like, if I had to pick every single scene that we've seen so far it would probably be this first um that one scene where we were like under the lake and then the third picture was like everyone there when we first met up i want to know um who was the artist who did like these uh scenes in particular because they did an incredible job like just the coloring and the shading and everything it's it's really beautiful. I love it. So, let's just enjoy now. Leo sighs again, then looks straight at, down at me, meeting my eyes. Chase? Yeah? He pauses, looking off to the side before turning his eyes back on mine. <gasps> I love you. I immediately look away. Pl Chase, please. Please just come back. I miss you so much, every day. I stare ac out across the field, not able to meet his eyes again. I I'll stop smoking, I'll stop picking on Clint. I'll get rid of the gun, just please, come back. <sighs> I 
I, I just... I, I don't know, Leo. You know how I don't like it there, and I feel like I should keep my options open. Find a good job and a good place to live. Just for a year or two, while you're getting on your feet, I, I'll give you a place to stay. That sounds great, Leo, but to get back together, that's like setting ourselves up for another breakup, and I don't want to do that. But then we know for sure, without parents or school in the way. It'll just be us, and then... Even if it doesn't work out, then, you know, there's some closure there. For the first time, I feel myself seeing things from Leo's point of view. I'm not necessarily losing anything by at least trying. And you know, he's right. There wasn't any closure, mostly because of me. Leo must sense my indecision because he immediately presses forward. And I'll... I'll be making enough to support you while you figure things out. Hey, I, I don't want to mooch. <laughs> I don't mind, I just want you to be comfortable so you can do what you want to do. But, Echo. Leo's quiet for a while, a long while before he finally speaks up. <sighs> now that I can't fix, but I guess that's one way to decide it, is to weigh what's more important to you. You're asking me to choose. I, I'm not asking that exactly. Leo glances at me. But if I did, I blow it a long sigh. So you are. He doesn't say anything, so my mind starts wandering over the years we spent together. Despite how much we fight, there's no question in my mind what the answer is, and it hits me like a thunderbolt. Well, I choose you. All at once, his face explodes into a grin. So much happiness in one expression that I don't think I'd ever be able to take back what I just said, even if I wanted to. And instantly, I'm wrapped in a tight, warm hug, and one that crushes the air from my lungs. Oh my god, Chase, I love you so fucking much! Hey! But you still got a year of school left before we're gonna have to get back into contact, and we're gonna have to exchange. I clasp my, his muzzle shut with my hand around it, and he just stares at me with his wide eyes. I didn't even say yes. I take my hand away from his muzzle. Oh, well, what'd you say? I look again towards the sunset, past the concrete bleachers and goalposts, in the direction of Echo and take a deep breath. I look back at Leo. Yes. And then he he's kissing me. It's not rough like it was in the train yard. His mouth stays closed, but he holds my head gently and it's like he's trying to pour all of his love into me through just his lips. As ridiculous as it might sound, I can feel it. Oh, that's really cute. That is really cute. I love that. That that actually made me tear up a little bit. That I'm not even joking. That was like the cutest fucking thing in the entire world right there. Oh man, this fucking game knows how to play me. Uh, <laughs> man. Leo's heavy, soft body presses me into the bed, licking and kissing up my neck. Also, don't worry about the Nazi for working. Just... Oh, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> we had that one scene with Carl in the last, in the last uh, pathway that we took. His hands slide up and down my body, filling out everything. He's gasping like he can't catch his breath. I lay there, my eyes shut as if... Up, 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 up. I, sl sorry, hold it. I slide my own hands back... To down his back until they reach his rear and squeeze hard into his tail, forcing another gasp out of the big wolf. Slowly, he starts to lick down the length of my body, starting with my chest and down my stomach. Oh wait, are we in another... Are we in another naughty naughty scene? He pauses to snuffle and tease against my navel before his mouth finally closes around me. My eyes roll back as I clutch into the sheets, arching my back. I listen as Leo showers down the hall and I smile as I hear him singing. I usually shower with him back in the day, but I was so tired and passed out as soon as we both finished. Oh! Okay! Okay. Loki, that's pretty hot. Once I opened my eyes again, Leo was already in the shower. I'm about to drift off again when I hear Leo's phone buzz. 
He'd been on it all day, probably trying to coordinate a meeting with the others. It's already Friday, which is hard to believe. We had to get together again before we lost a chance. I look over. The screen is already lit up, so I sit up and look. A message from Flynn. Yeah, well, fuck you too. Not exactly a surprising message to get from Flynn, but still, I wonder what they're fighting about. From the sounds of it, Leo is still in the middle of his shower, still rocking out his diva pop song. <gasps> Ooh. This is where shit gets real. Okay, so... So I know that there's two endings to this, and this is definitely, definitely what's going to decide it. So we're going to make two save slots right here. I got to remember that this is going to be the one where, where we're going to be going with one specific path. Oh man, what do we choose though? What do we choose? Do we respect his privacy or we, do we check his phone? Uh, like, I don't want to be a stalker to the boy. See what happens in both? I know, but like, <laughs> which one do we go with first? Because this is a really hard decision. Because, again, this is going to decide whether or not uh, we get a good ending for this or a bad ending for this. Uh, like, I kind of want to find out. Uh, I said we would be nice. We would be nice to the big wolf, but I'm curious. I'm curious to see what what's going on. What's some amount of oh my god? You see what I mean? With some amount of guilt, I reach over and grab his phone and open up his text. Immediately, I see a few pin conversations. They're from me. Judging by the dates, they're from when I was still away at college. There's also a few saved attachments, and I quickly swipe away to the other more recent conversations. The latest is from the early, earlier this morning, and it looks like it was to Flynn. Chase has a project to do. Bullshit, you're fucking with him again, huh? I'm helping him. You planned this from the start, didn't you? What? This whole thing was to get back in his pants. How about I plan this after you ruined the entire week, huh? Yeah, well, fuck you too. I frown. It's too bad Leo and Flynn are still fighting, but for some reason, their exchange has me feeling uneasy. I pull up his n recent text thread. The one with Carl. Carl asked when Leo were hanging out again. When we were hanging out again yesterday night. Leo pokes some fun about him sleeping in the crawl space. Then Leo tells him that he isn't sure. That I'll probably be too busy with my project to hang out. Leo never asked me. I feel my heart start to pound. Today Carl texted again asking how things were going. Leo tells him that I wanted to go through the high school for nostalgia's sake. That I wanted to be alone for it. He sent that to... It acts as if it was on a whim, and Jenna asks if Leo is avoiding her, if she said something is wrong. Leo tells her everything's fine, but again, I'm too busy to hang out. And then his text to TJ. Hey, yesterday was so much fun. I know you said you were probably going to be busy, but I wanted to check. Chase is still pretty sad about what happened Monday. I think he needs more time. Oh, okay. Please tell him I'm sorry. He told me it was fine yesterday, but I guess he must have been faking it for my sake. Yeah, he's still pretty broken up. We'll figure it out, though. I'm gripping the phone hard. Khalil really been done. No, he couldn't have. And not to TJ. I sit there quietly, listening to my wolf continue to sing. My stomach twists as I realize that now I have to confront him on this. I've let things slide before, but this was on a different level. I hug my knees and stare at the wall, feeling strangely violated now. As I stare, I see a dark spot with spindly, with spindly legs move across the wall. The spider pauses as if acknowledging me before disappearing into the dark corner. No, he couldn't have! He wouldn't do that! I sit on the hard, uneven ground, shivering as I try to cover myself up with the blanket. 
My eyes adjust enough for me to realize I'm outside somewhere and looking through the branches of dead trees to many stars above me. Aside from the calls of a few birds, it's completely silent. I stare at the sky above me for a while, wishing that I wasn't so cold that so I could go back to sleep. Where am I? The slight confusion I feel mixed in with the ap apathy of just waking up is a familiar feeling. I can remember when my parents forced me into Boy Scouts ten years ago. I hated it so much, especially the camping. I could never fall asleep, and when I finally did it, it would be m marred by me tossing and turning, waking up in confusion as to where I was. I'd sit up straight in the tent, looking around, for, looking around me for ten, up to ten minutes, wondering why I was in complete darkness and sitting in the sleeping bag. Except now there's no tent or sleeping bag. My mind works slowly like it's drenched in molasses, and I need ground, and I need the ground with my fingers, digging them into the ditch vegetation and soil. And then finally, I break through the barrier to the lucidity, and I realize that's what's happening to me is real. I'm outside. I look to the left and right, and I see I'm surrounded by trees or bushes. The smell of sagebrush and dirt fills my nostrils as I unsteadily get to my feet. My limbs and flesh are numb from the cold, and I rub my hands up and down my arms, trying to find some warmth. Did I sleepwalk? I must have, unless Leo took me out here for some reason, or someone else did. I shiver. There's not much else I can do except walk forward. Ahead of me, it looks like the branches clear out into more darkness. I hope it's just Leo. I hope that I'm just behind Leo's house where I know there are some bushes and trees. Either way, I can't be that far from the house, so I start walking, reaching out blindly to move past sharp branches and prickly bushes. The pain wasn't that bad, not nearly as bad as you think it would be. I look back behind me, staring hard into the blackness. I can't see anything behind, beyond the branches right in front of me, which gives me the impression of gnarled teeth in front of a dark, endless mouth. Quickly, I turn back around and push through the dead vegetation in front of me, trying not to panic. But I knew I was dead the moment I looked down. A branch scrapes across my cheek, and another stabs me hard in the hip as I run right into it. Two stumps gushing blood, splashing the wheels of the train and rails. I finally break it out into the open. Now I can see more stars above me, but the complete lack of a moon makes almost everything impossible for me to see. I can at least tell there's a large clearing, but no matter how hard I squint, I can't see ahead of me. Tentatively, I start walking forward, looking left and right for any signs of light that might help me guide my, me back to the town. I can feel a worrying seed of panic starting up in my chest, and I worry it's going to explode out of me at any second. The last thing I need is me running through the night screaming my head off. Pretty soon, I became aware of what looks like a large black block in front of me. Again, I reach out my hands, walking slower as I approach whatever it is that's in front of me. They press up against something rough, hard, and cold. Whatever it is, it's made up of some type of metal. It feels broken and rusted, so I assume it's old. Was it a warehouse of some kind? I sidestep to the right until my hands run up against some bars that stick out from the structure, and that's when it hits me. It's a freight car from the old train. Sure enough, the next thing my hands meet is an empty space as I come across what I remember to be the open door I had sat in earlier. I was at... Wait! Is he having the dream, like, is he having, like, a vision where he sees that, that guy's body? Or, or he sees, like, through his perspective? You know, the, the guy with, like, the broken, le the, I was, I almost laughed. Did my anxiety about finishing the project cause me to sleepwalk all the way back out here? At least now I know exactly where I am. I rest my hands on the edge of the car, breathing in the musty air inside. There's a hint of something sweet and sick on the top of it, and it crosses my mind that anything could have crawled inside and died. I quickly move away from the car. Turning my body in the direction I know Leo's house is in, I start walking again, pouring through my recent memories to see if I could somehow remember the how the hell I got here. I remember Leo putting me back into the bedroom, putting his arm around me, then nothing. I definitely fell asleep. Sleepwalking is the only answer. The sound of rustling behind me makes me jump, but I keep moving forward, not wanting a tiny creature in the grass getting me spooked. Squinting ahead of me, I see no lights, which is strange, because I know Echo should at least have a few lights on. The street lights are lit. A loud metallic clang fills the air, and this time I do whirl around. Hello? My voice is still scratching from waking up, and I cough to clear it. Hello? The loudness in my voice actually startles me, but the response is silence. Did a bird hit it? Maybe I knocked something loose when I was filling around. Well, I'm definitely not going back to check it out, though. So with a quickened pace, I start moving again. 
That's when I hear more shifting around in the car, like something is rolling around inside. I stop walking again and hold still, perking my ears as I try to hold my breath, with my heart pounding. This time I don't call out, and instead, just listen. I swallow, and it's so loud that I almost jump at that sound. But again, the sound stops completely. I wait a while longer before I start moving again, this time at a slight jog. A crazy thought enters my mind where I think maybe Leo and I got really drunk, and maybe we both came out here and blacked out. And that Leo's in the train car right now, hung over and rolling around. It's in the middle of that thought, though, that the sound starts up again. It's louder this time and ends with cutting off for a split second before something heavy thuds to the dead vegetation below. I stop again, but this time it's so that whatever it is doesn't hear me, knowing that if I keep walking, the heavy crunches of my footsteps will allow it for, it, allow for it to pinpoint me immediately. My throat is completely dry and a new thought enters my mind. It could be Clint. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he comes out here to sleep in the train cars. That would be totally something that he'd do. While it does ease my worries a bit, but I'm, I'm, I'm not fully relaxed because I know the dumb fuck has a gun. I also know that he wouldn't hesitate to shoot at something if it startled him. So I crouch down a bit, waiting, listening. Now I'm pretty sure I can hear the breathing, ragged, wheezing breathing that definitely sounds like Clint. I gather up some spit in my mouth so my tongue doesn't stick to the roof of it and take a small breath. Hey, Clint? I say it gently, quietly, but I'm sure th that he can hear me. I get some more silence in return, but I also get the distinct feeling that he's listening back. I try again. It's me, chi- There's an explosion of energy and the sound in front of me, but it's not a gunshot. Instead, it's a sense of forward momentum that I can physically feel, that whatever's in front of me is lunging forward at me. Two loud thuds. One following the other and less than halfway, followed by an explosive dragon sound. The cycle repeats the second it ends. Whatever it sounds, whatever it is, sounds desperate, almost maniac. But I don't stick around to find out before I know it. My legs are carrying me through the clearing as fast as I can. All thoughts of what could be gone are from my mind as I launch, as I dodge into the trees and bushes to my right, knowing that I can break through the other side. I'll be right in front of Leo's house. What's behind me though is slow, moving impossibly fast. Already it sounds like the distance between me and this cut has cut in half and I'm struggling between branches and sagebrush. I hear it break into the brush with me. I gasp as full on panic sets in. Leo! Leo! I scream as loud as I can knowing that he should be able to hear me also knowing that he sleeps like a rock. The thing behind me seems to double its efforts at the sound of my voice and the cycle of its movement increased. It now has the momentum of a gallop. My breath start coming in panic gasps and I know I'm not going to make it because it's only three feet behind me. As if a window opens up in the back of my mind, I see it. Two clawed hands outstretched towards me, a face that flashes past too far for me to make out, but I manage to see a lipless mouth. And then it slams into my back and crushes me into the ground against sharp branches and rocks. I gasp as the air is crushed out of me, but before I can suck it back again, those hands wrap around my neck. I struggle and pull, but it's like I'm an ant under a foot. I'm so thoroughly pinned that I can't even budge an inch. There's hissing behind my head and I feel dripping against the back of my neck. Tears squeeze out of my eyes as I try to reach forward, but it's like I'm paralyzed. Paralyzed. I'm yanked back. Suddenly my face is coming out of something soft and white. A pillow. Oh, Chase. Chase, are you okay? Leo's husky voice whispers into my ears. I take in a huge gasp of air. Whoa. Can't breathe? I cough and gasp. My face wet. My face wet with tears as I sit in the bed looking around. Oh, baby, it's okay. Leo draws me into a warm hug and I take it limply, my mind only now catching up. I cough a few more times. Sorry, paralysis. I, I couldn't move. Leo rocks me a few times, making shushing sounds. I remember you telling me about that. Good thing I was here to pull you out of your pillow. I nod against his chest, realizing how dangerous it could have been if he hadn't been there. I usually came out of the paralysis under a minute, but sometimes... I shudder and pull back out of the hug, wiping my face. What'd you dream about? I tried to think back, but the dream is slaying my mind as fast as whatever that was that was chasing me. What was chasing me? I... I can't remember. Leo rubs my shoulder and looks at my face. It's dark, but I can see the white... Uh, but I can see the white of his eye patches, giving him an almost ghostly appearance. You wanna stay up? I can make you... Uh, like, tea or something. The adrenaline is already leaving me to be replaced by fatigue, but the offer sounds nice. 
Sure. All right. Want to come with me? I paused and shake my head, wanting to collect myself alone for a moment. Nah, no, just just give me a second. All right. Leo leans, leans forward and kisses me on the forehead before leaving me alone in the dark room. I lay back down on my side, trying to remember what I dreamed about. I was in the woods, and then something was after me. I, that's all I can recall. The warmth Leo left in the bed quickly has me drowsy again, and I'm about to drift off when something pokes me in the foot. I try to ignore it, but the thought of an insect of some kind has me reaching down to feel at it. It's hard and crackly, whatever it is, and when I pull up, I find a dead leaf. Frowning, I pull back the sheets, and there, clinging to the fabric and fur on my feet, it's, it's dirt and leaves. All right, it's Saturday. Th this is where it's like usually the longest out of the entire uh, story. Leo wakes me up early by the next day, telling me that he has to settle some stuff with his dad at the shop. I don't get much of a chance to ask why or for how long before he's out the door yelling something about food being in the fridge. I immediately fall back asleep though, and when I do open my eyes again, it's two hours later. Leo texted me like half an hour ago. Eric, hi! Welcome on in! The Blap welcomes you! How's it going, buddy? This game is called Echo. It's a it's a furry visual novel that's been in development for six years, apparently. And it was finished in... Uh, what was it? it? It was somewhere in 2020, I think? But, yeah. So this is like a psychological uh, horror visual novel that has five different paths that take forever to finish. And we are on path three, but oh no, we're, we're on Leo's route, but there's two paths that we take in this, and we're on one of the paths right now. April, oh shoot, wait, it, it actually, did it actually finish this year? Holy crap, okay then. Looks like a PS1 game? I wouldn't really say that. Still at Pop Shop, but we'll be back soon. I think. I swallow back down to the lump of dread in my throat as I remember the text messages. I didn't want to confront them, not one bit, but I can't just let it sit. Something has to be said before I leave. I lay around for another 20 minutes before grabbing my phone to browse a bit. That's when I realized I hadn't charged it last night, and my battery just at 25%. Beautiful! Because the last episode, well, the last path that we took, which was Carl, your phone died. I groan and throw an arm over my knees. Wait, knees? My eyes. One day left to do the project. I'm so far behind, though, that I'm not even feeling any anxiety about it at this point. Maybe a bit earlier, but yeah, this... Wow, okay, then. So this, so then this game is, like, new. This is like a brand new game. Just resigned. I should have known better, really, that I wasn't going to get anything done with Leo around. I stare at the wall for a while longer before I force myself to set up. No use lying around. I might not be making my best project, but it didn't mean I couldn't do a few things to make it less terrible. Food momentarily crosses my mind, but I shrug it off. I've never been a breakfast person anyway. Same. I, I'm not really much of a breakfast person anymore. I'm more of like an eat at 12 or 1 in the afternoon. As soon as I leave the house, I notice things are a bit off. Firstly, it's dead quiet. Usually there's some kind of drone, whether it's the wind or a plane overhead. There's usually something. No sound of birds either, and those are always chirping in the morning. I stand in the doorway for a bit, feeling a vague sense of tension and electricity in the air. Something building. I shake my head, feeling dizzy. That dream last night had fucked me up in all kinds of ways, so I'm not, it's not surprising that it's probably still messing with me. I'll be glad to be gone from this place tomorrow. Some rustling next door draws my attention, and I see Kudzu carrying a set of clippers walk across his front yard. I open my mouth to say hi, but I hold back, feeling self-conscious. His brooding nature was a bit intimidating, and I don't know if he's the kind of person who expects a greeting or not. I'm not left to wonder long, though, because he spots me almost immediately and raises a hand. Morning. Oh, hey there. He grunts before settling his, his setting his attention on a bush in front of him, sizing it up. I stand there awkwardly for a bit longer, wondering if that's the end of our exchange, but he speaks up again. Leo take off? 
He nods his head at the empty driveway. Oh yeah, earlier this morning. I walk down from the porch and walk over to the edge of Leo's lawn so he doesn't feel like we're yelling at each other. He said something about having to take care of business with his dad. I see. Kutsu stops trimming and looks up at me before smiling. <laughs> he can come on my lawn, it's not like I have an electric fence or anything. Looking down, I see him towing the edge of his immaculate lawn on Leo's side, looking like a little kid. I blush before stepping over to the crunch along with the tan colored gravel that he had set out. It's weird how nice it all is, especially compared to the shitty trailer that's sitting in the middle of it all. If he had an adobe styled house, the place would be southwestern perfection. This all looks really nice. I guess gardening is your hobby. Thanks. Kudzu snips at the bush rather aggressively. I like it. It's what I do most of the day. The raccoon moves to the side of the bush, examining it. It's peaceful. He gives the bush another snip before resting a hand on his hip while he lets the clip his dangle on the other. And he keeps you in shape. <gasps> Fox! Hi! Hi, buddy! How's it going? The dumb leper welcomes you. I'm happy to have you here, buddy. <laughs> How's it going, you cutie wolf? I can't argue with that. Although he's skinny, the muscles showed through his fur and his arms. He's probably the most in-shape guy I've seen in Echo. I realize I'm staring and quickly snap my eyes back to his, but he's already smirking. I worry he's about to point that out that he's caught me, but instead he gestures at my camera bag with his clippers. Gonna do something for your project? Uh, yeah, I need to get a bit more film before I leave tomorrow. I'm okay, back from class, ready to chill with you. <gasps> Yay! How exciting! <laughs> I'm happy that you... I'm happy that you're here, buddy. It's good to see you. It's always good to see you. The slender raccoon wipes his forehead with a forearm. Anything in particular? I think. Not really, just old stuff to show this old stuff to show the town's age. Kutsu sticks the clippers into the ground looking up as he seems to think. I know of a few things. You go to the old school? Yeah, I was headed there actually. And then there's the ruins next to the lake. Yeah, I was gonna wait for Leo to drive me there later today. Other than that, there's an old rusted pump up the road, but I don't know if that's actually from Echo's earlier days. Yeah, it couldn't hurt to look. Where is it exactly? Kutsu points over to my shoulder up the road. Down past Duke's house, right before the convenience store. It's kind of hidden back in some brush, but I can take you there. Oh, if it's no trouble. It's fine. I've got plenty of time to do this today. Well, alright. Thanks. I shift the bag on my shoulder and stand to the side as Kutsu tosses the clippers behind the bush and starts walking towards the road. I follow him quietly, again feeling awkward under his no-nonsense attitude. So, you and Leo getting along? Yeah, we're having fun. My mind wanders back to his text messages and my stomach clenches. Good. He's been looking forward to this week for a while now. Wouldn't shut up about it last week. I'm somewhat surprised that Kutsu's filling the silence between us. Not that I mind. He's pretty damn good at it for such a somber guy. I smile. Yeah, that's that's Leo. He really misses our old pack. Or does he? Kutsu huffs out a laugh. <laughs> Wolves. I agree. Wolves. <laughs> that's the same thing with me. I, I miss everyone every day. Because you guys are all a part of my pack. And I'm happy to have you guys as part of my pack. The blood pack, actually. You know what? That's actually not a bad name. We'll call this up the blood pack. The blood squad was given uh, by Fire Tiger, but I think we might turn ourselves into the into the blood pack. <laughs> As we walk, I can smell the heavy musk coming from the raccoon mingled with the scent with the scent neutralizer. Evidence of a hard day's work. There's something special about hanging out with another musky creature. It makes you less self-conscious. So I know you hate Payton, but don't you have to go back there for work? Back in the day, I had a job studying desert plants after college. Good times. Yeah, we're the butt pack. That would definitely put it in a few steps above most everyone living in Echo, where a high school diploma is a rare thing. I'm a clerk in the town hall, so no, I'm pretty much always here. Always? Do you have a car? Sold it after I came here. Wow, D don't you have to get out to shop for food? 
Sometimes, I grow and fish for what I can, and the convenience store has a surprisingly good produce section, but otherwise Leo gives me rides once in a while. Ah, gotcha. Again, I'm curious about what exactly happened in Peyton. I'm gonna be gone by tomorrow, and I don't find the question to be too intrusive, especially with all the information he's provided me so far. So, uh, I don't want to be nosy. I let the statement hang for a moment, and then Kutsu turns his head towards me. Then, maybe you shouldn't ask. That stops me short, and I almost stop walking. Uh, I feel my face get warm, even under the heat of the sun. I glance over at the raccoon, but his expression isn't accu accusatory or angry. It's just as neutral as it always is. It makes me wonder if this raccoon's just the way of sp if this is just the way that. Uh, it makes me wonder if this is just the raccoon's way of speaking. I already know how blunt he can be. I decide to trust what uh, what little I know about him and press forward. No? I ask it with the same straight face. Well, you should always ask yourself if asking something nosy is a good idea. No reason to do if it's going to piss someone off needlessly. Ah. But before I can even consider, Kuzu goes on. Now, considering what we were just talking about, I can probably guess what you were going to ask. I can feel the embarrassment returning. Yeah, but before I answer it, I have a question for you. I shrink a little more into myself. Yeah? Why do you care? The question definitely catches me by surprise, and at first I wonder if this is just Kutsu's way of telling me to shut up. But again, after looking at his face, I decide to just tell him the truth. I clear my throat. Well, I like you. You're a cool guy. It comes out rather lamely, but it's the truth. He has a demeanor of not really giving a fuck about what others think of him. It's like Flynn, except Kutsu doesn't seem like he was putting up a front at all. On top of that, he stopped... He's... On top of that, he stepped in to stop a crowbar wielding drug addict when he saw his friend in danger. Kutsu laughs genuinely, and it's a bit startling. <laughs> That's really the reason? I'm flustered again. Well, yeah. Fair enough. I like you too. Leo was mostly right about you. Uh, what did Leo say about me? <coughs> a lot of things, but you can't expect a wolf as love smitten as he, he is to not exaggerate, can you? Ah, uh, no, I guess not. I step on a particularly large rock and nearly lose my balance. Before I can even stumble, though, Kutsu's grasping my arm tightly, stopping me from running into him. Whoa, sorry, thanks. This rat could have damn fast reflexes. Uh, no problem. I start to walk again, but Kutsu doesn't move. I stop and glance at him, but he's looking up at the road, not at me. I lost someone and paid in. It takes me a moment to realize what he's talking about. But then I do. By a guy with a gun who didn't give a fuck. I swallow and I don't say anything, looking down at the ground. <sighs> Happened on the same street we lived on. Of course, I had no idea what to say and wait for Kutsu to go on, but he doesn't. When I look up and see he's looking right at me, I swallow. Yeah, that would make me want to move too. Yeah, people. And there's less of them here. I'm sorry. Kutsu just looks back at me. Why? I open my mouth, but before I can say anything, Kutsu smiles. <laughs> Kidding. I let my breath out in relief and I laugh a little. <laughs> well, uh, should we keep going? I make as if to walk up the road again, but Kutsu doesn't follow. When I look back, he nods at the brush on the side of the road. It's right here. I wasn't expecting much, and I'm not disappointed as we come up on the pump. Mostly it's just a rusted piece of metal sticking out on the ground. Kudzu seems a bit put off by how lame it is himself. Smaller than I remember it being. Meh, it's something at least. I'll get a few shots out of it. I started packing the camera from the bag, a bit reluctant to do it for something so insignificant. How did you find this thing anyway? I looked towards the road, which is basically hidden by the dense bush in front of me. Needed to take a piss. I know my house is right there, but peeing outside is liberating. Ah. Speaking of which, I'm gonna go do that. He pauses. <laughs> I can do it in front of the pump if you like, for effect. <laughs> I was a laugh wondering if this is the first time I heard the raccoon make a joke. At least I hope it's a joke. My laughing turns into a groan, though, when I see the battery level. First my phone, now this. What's up? Could you ask from a bit deeper in the brush, facing away from me. 
Man, my battery's low. I'm not gonna have enough for the school. I have to go grab. Uh, I have to go back and grab a spare. Oh well, why don't you finish the footage for the pump while I run back and grab you another battery? You sure? Well, yeah, it'll be faster. I've seen. I've been in this house a few times. Where's it at? And a dock on his desk nest. Uh, and a dock on his desk nest next to his computer. All right, I'll be back. And with that, Kuzi jogs off out of the bush and back into the road. Within a minute, I feel like I have all the footage I can get out of the pump. I sigh and rub my face, glad to at least be out of the sun, but annoyed that I got so little footage for it. As I'm doing this, I hear what sounds like a gag behind me. I perk my ears and look back. I hear it again, but it's softer and more of a grunt this time. I'm almost positive that Kuzi didn't go that way, but I can imagine who else it might be. Could you? I wonder if maybe the heat has gotten to him. I know how dangerous a heat stroke can be. Getting a little worried, I start moving further into the brush. I gonna hear a gag and it's much louder this time. Could? You alright? I start pushing deeper and with a bit more urgency and not 20 yards in I come into a clearing. The ground is covered in dead grass and the sun hits me again with a vengeance. I blink furiously, eyes watering under the brightness of the clearing and blazing red behind my eyelids. After a few seconds, I'm able to pry my eyes open. The first thing I notice is a peeling trailer to the right, pressed up against the trees. I have some vague memories of a trailer back here where, I was, where Grumpy Badger used to live. Straight in front of me, the meadow is a dead tree with one dry, gnarled branches that, tw that twists up into the sky. The tree itself would be eerie enough, but it's what's under it that stops me dead. It takes a moment to comprehend what I see. Hanging from the lowest branches of... Okay. Disgustingly, my mind immediately goes to the camera. I don't know why. Yeah, showing footage of a dead body to the whole class. Either I get an A for being edgy or I fail for showing a fucking dead body. Probably expelled, actually. I feel my stomach started to turn and I'm finally able to take my first step back. But then it moot. It's a quick jerk. One of the skeleton's hands reaching up sp spasmodically to its neck before slumping back down. With my eyes fully adjusted to the sun now, I recognize the color of the fur the build that, of that skeleton like body clint unsteadily i feel on unsteady feet i managed to stumble across stumble forward and reach out towards the ringtail aiming to at least hold him up until i could shout kudzu over to help somehow though he's able to spin and face me his face an expression a mortified fury his eyes are almost glowing with how bloodshot they are and his twisted muzzles covered in jewel leaking down on his chin onto his chest get back leaf what? Clinton, what the hell are you doing? I move forward again, but Clinton lashes out with a foot, hitting me in the knee. That's when I see his toes are touching the ground, at least barely. I stare in confusion and look back up to meet Clinton's furious eyes. F fucking leave! Spit flies from his muzzle as I take a step back, completely at a loss for words. I- I don't- His bulging eyes move from mine to look over at my shoulder, and his enraged expression melts, eyes growing whiter. Slowly, I turn around and my vision is filled with a mountain of brown fur. My eyes take a moment to draw out and focus where they do. I realize I'm actually looking at a bear. A huge one. Even for a bear. Huge, naked, and carrying a long, thin branch. The bear stands in the direction I'm coming from, grinning stupidly at me. Instinctively. I widen my stance, eyes looking left and right. All the reason has seemingly left the land of Echo, and now my brain has left to try and pull, put the pieces of the crazy place together. I watch as a huge tongue sticks out from between the bulbary licks to lick at them, smiling slimily between the gaps in my uh, missing teeth. Once he's done with that, he breaks out into the grin again, those black lips shimmering under the sun. This a friend, cat? The weirdly high-pitched voice is about as startling as his size. I look back at Clint, who's still struggling to stand on his toes, clutching at the rope now. So hard finding a good switch back here, but now it's worth... But now it's worth... It, it, if it... If there's two of yes. uh, The squeak that count, comes out of my muzzle seems to perk the bear's stubby ears and licks his lips again to see him as he eyes me up and down. I uh, I should get going. Sorry about sorry about seeing. Words fail me as the bear takes a step forward and I start sidestepping, preparing myself to make a run for it. The bear mimics my stance and my stomach stop and drops as I see him take another step forward. I change my trajectory and back away instead. This time he doesn't follow me, he just grins as he watches me move back into the brush. Clint struggles on the end of his rope, twirling around lazily as he tries to get a foothold. 
I get one last look at his face as he spins around and I'm stuck I'm struck by the expression. For a moment, I'm nine years old again. Running from behind the buildings on Main Street, probably from the imaginary foreign agents of some kind. When I hide behind the tree next to Clint's house, I hear the screen door open, and for several minutes I watch Clint breathing deeply into a rag. I'm too young to understand, but for some reason I know it's not good. When I finally decide to run from my hiding spot, Clint looks up and we meet eyes. His are wide and wild, confused and hurt, just like now. I stumble into the brush, finally seeing, feeling like I'm far enough away to turn it and really make a run for it. Kutu is standing next to the pump when I get back, holding a battery. What? I grab his arm and yank him towards the road. Come on. I mutter under my breath before jogging down the road, Kutu close behind looking over his shoulder. It's not until we're at the end of the road turning onto Main Street before I'm able to slow myself down and tell Kutu what happened. Holy shit, that's Brian! Who? I'm still panning, sweating heavily under the heat after the short jog down the street. Big ass bear that lives in the brush, right? Here's a trailer in there. I don't. I didn't know him. Did he move here after I left? I thought a badger lived in that trailer. I assume so. He was here when I got here. Well, what the fuck is he doing? What the hell did I just see? My mind is still trying to process it. I don't have the answer. I can't say I'm surprised though. Are you serious? That's like the most fucked up thing I've seen. Kutsu smirks. Well, I guess we would have to have been there, huh? I stare at him. Yeah, I guess. But from what I know, Brian, he's dumb and violent. Pretty sure he came here because he caused too much trouble in Payton. It's Clint that's the fucked up as it's Clint that's the fucked up part. He's a fucking homophobe, but he's doing that shit? I don't know much about Clint either. What I do know is that Brian is his dealer. Really? Well, really the entire town's dealer. It made sense that Clint would need one in Echo, considering he was banned from life from ever driving after getting like 3D what? Damn, okay! But I thought Jeremy did that. Carl told me that's where he gets his weed. Kuzi shrugs again. I assume Clint was using more than just marijuana. Huh. It's becoming clearer what kind of relationship Clint and the bear have. I shudder, just wishing that I hadn't had to witness it. I already feel bad for Clint, but now? Kutsu holds out the battery still in his hand. Wanna move to the school? Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that. The next hour is pretty un uneventful, though I do get enough footage to the point where I'm satisfied. It's the point where I notice Duke down the road. He stands there for a while, watching us as if I'm getting different angles at the school. It's annoying, but even though he's a complete fuck-up, he likes to pretend he's in control of things in Echo. Probably just promoted himself to sheriff of the town in his mind or something. I ignore him, though, and the next time I look up, he's gone. I turn my attention back to the project, finally able to calculate how much work I actually have left. Now, most of my work is going to have to happen the night before the due date. I swallow, the stomach churning at the thought. On the bright side, all of the stress is pushing the memory of Clint being hanged and whipped out of my mind. Later on, I finally get a nice text from Leo, just before my phone dies. Heading back. I'm hungry. We should meet up later. Sure. I invite Kutsi to come along, but he tells me that he can't stand diner food and he was going to go fishing anyway. It's too bad, because I've really been enjoying the raccoon's company, and fishing sounds relaxing. I try to exchange numbers with the raccoon, but my screen dies the moment I turned it on. Kutsu takes my number, though, and promises to text me. I'm feeling better walking down to the diner, but then I remember what happened with Leo. What I might have to do. Should I bring it up now? I don't even know where I'll end up going. Could I even trust him again? Leo's not in the diner when I get there. I pick up a booth towards the back, resting my head against the patch of cushions and closing my eyes. The week's gone by so fast. It feels like only yesterday we actually got here. Thinking back, I remember worrying that everything was going to be awkward, that our past would catch up in the worst way possible. And it kind of did. We didn't fix or talk about anything. That gives me a jolt of realization and sadness. This whole time I'd been preoccupied with Leo, and Leo with me. Wasn't Leo the one that was all concerned about us not keeping the pack together? This send-off feels empty and pointless. It's really the last time I might get to hang out with some of them, mainly Jenna and TJ. TJ had the most shit to air out. Did I fuck by basically ignoring him this whole time? I feel a lump in my throat as I think about the hike and I never went on with him. Sure, I'd figure things out with Leo, at least temporarily. Very temporarily, actually. Already things are in jeopardy again. But now it feels like 
things I should have talked about with the others have been buried further. Even though I haven't seen the others for a few days, I can feel their resentment, knowing that Leo and I had got what we wanted. Or at least I thought I got what I wanted, especially after leaving them to deal with the fallout of Flint's meltdown. And now because of that, it'll be harder to reach the roof of the problem, harder to talk about it, and because of that, we probably never will. I glance at my dead phone, reminded of the complete lack of text from anyone other than Leo. Wait, can you... That, okay, I'm gonna admit, that's pretty freaky. I I don't know if it comes across on camera, but if you look really closely at the phone, you can kind of see uh you can kind of see Chase like staring at you. I don't know if it, that comes across on camera, but that is freaky. I suppose that this is life. Sometimes things are buried and never talked about again. And in a way, I guess that's for the best. Sydney's death. Sydney's death will die with us. It just sucks that we all carry it, but we can't rely on each other for support. Yeah, it does? Okay, good. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I didn't expect to see that. But, yeah, that is really freaky. I, I don't think I've ever seen that. Especially in Carl's route. I don't think I've seen that when he brought his dead phone up. I take a deep breath, wondering how long it'll take me to process this whole trip. Or maybe my entire life up to this moment. It's up at this point when I notice Jenna, Janice hasn't come up to take my order. The diner itself is just completely quiet. No rock, no old rockabilly coming over to the staticky speakers. I look around, wondering if maybe this is the place that, if the place is closed. I remember a few businesses didn't lock their doors. Mostly because of the negligent employees, because burglary is somewhat common here. There's some creepy shit they do with that if you pay attention. Got it. I will keep that in mind. I looked at the plastic window in the swinging door next to the kitchen past the counter and noticed that the fluorescent lights are definitely on. In fact, it looks like I can see some movement from the shadows on the wall. I think it's about getting up and knocking on the door to let them know I'm here, but that's when the front doors push open. Leo comes in. A big grin on his face. Chula! My stomach twists as he sweeps it to the side, and I can't help but jerk away when he kisses at my cheek. He pulls back, frowning. Oh, come on! This is the bad ending, isn't it? Chase? I sigh, not able to meet his eyes. Leo, I need to talk to you about something. Immediately, I can see the worry in his eyes. He steps back, watching me. What? Sit down. Why? Leo asks me, but sits down anyway. First off, I have to tell him that I looked at his fucking phone, and that's bad enough. I look to the right, with my heart pounding. Otter, what is it? His voice is soft, but I can hear the slight tremble in it. Leo, I looked at your phone. What? I jump as Leo his hackle rises and he bares his teeth. It's not an angry reaction, more defensive and fearful. Leo, why the fuck would you do that? I shrink back, looking down as I listen to his breath picking up. I'm sorry, but you know what I saw. Fuck, fuck, man. Leo puts his face in his hands, which gives me an opportunity to look up. His ears are down, drooping towards the table. I... Why did you do that? I wait a while while Leo continues to hide his face, his body rocking. Please, not now. Not now what? You can't do this to me. Not now, not, not after... I didn't do anything. You're the one texting people that didn't give a fuck about them. His head snaps up, then I can see his eyes glistening. I, I didn't say that. I j just said you were busy. And what you said to TJ. Leo winces at that one, and he slumps back into his booth, his face dejected and desperate. Please, Chase, just try to understand. What? I let out some anger in my voice, wanting to show Leo that I'm not going to forgive him just because he's sad. And I think he realizes that because his face changes and his lips bared of, out of anger this time. Yeah, I'm real fucking guilty, aren't I? Yeah, you are. Says the asshole that just ditches me, avoids me, and won't even talk to me. Fuck, this is the bad ending, I knew it! <laughs> I don't say anything in response. And you wonder why I'm fucked up about this? You're the one that just walked out and left me! I was young. Yeah, you keep saying that like you're not young now. If you had actually dumped me, then maybe I wouldn't be in this. Uh, that wouldn't be this fucking messed up about it. 
The last sentence escalates into a scream and I flatten back into the booth, glaring up at him. He had never hurt me before and I'm not afraid he will now. I've endured plenty of his tantrums. Hey Rocky, how's it going? I think we just got the bad ending to Leo, which I didn't want to do. <laughs> because now we're arguing with our boy here and he was so happy to come and see us in this diner. Do you know how crazy this makes you look? Oh great, you too. I'm serious, this, this is fucking unacceptable. I'm drawing the line here. Leo's snarling face turns up, and that's when I hear movement behind me. I turn in my seat, and I see Janice striding out from behind the counter, the kitchen door swinging shut behind her. Janice? Leo's fur flattens back down like he's forgotten about our whole argument. It makes sense why. Something's wrong. Janice had been acting strange all week, gradually looking more haggard and pissed off as the time went on. Of course, I hadn't forgotten about what happened on the side of the road a few days back, but I'd been, on con but I'd been content with just assuming it had been just some kind of drug field adventure of hers. Now I'm convinced she's having a mental breakdown. Her fur is messed up on every inch of her body. Her eyes are wide and wild, wild and wide, similar to how I'd seen Clint earlier. Blood is smeared across her apron, and the handle of a knife sticks out of the front pot. Oh, Janice, are you okay? Leo's half standing. I'm not sure if it's because he's afraid of her, or for her, or of her. She doesn't say anything, and she set, settles up next to our booth, and I slide a bit towards the inside. Under her wild gaze, I'm feeling a little trapped. Janice? Why all the shouting? A little impatient? Well, let me take your order and I'll get you settled. Are, are you okay? Are you cooking? Leo gazes at her apron. Yes, yes, I'm cooking today. What can I make you? I get the unnerving feeling that she isn't even looking at us. Uh, Leo glances back at me, to which I respond with a bewildered look of my own. You know, I think we might... Nonsense, I've got everything fired up in the kitchen. Leo doesn't respond, just stares at the big coyote. And Jana smiled crookedly. Well, if you're not going to order something, then I'll just make your favorite. With that, she turns around and starts waddling off, having not even acknowledged me. What the fuck? I reach into my pocket thinking about calling an ambulance for the poor woman until I realize about my dead phone. I whisper over to Leo. Uh, should we leave? Maybe. But Leo doesn't move. He just stares after Janice. I look out the window to the sun-baked road. Have you noticed that something's off about Janice? No shit. Not just her, the whole town. I think about mentioning the meadow with Clint and Brian, but I'm still trying to absorb that myself. Leo sits back, still looking at the kitchen door where Janice disappeared. Honestly, people act so crazy here that I don't even know if it's because of drugs or they're actually crazy. Okay, let me just save here just in case. Oof, Brian, right? That that actually painted a bit of a picture in my head. <coughs> in that scene. I see his nose switch. And I don't think she knows how to cook. Something smells funny in there. I look back out the window wondering if I should bring up our argument again. That scene with Janice has totally thrown me off, and I'm reluctant to waste any more energy on yelling. It has to be brought up again somehow. We can't just let this sit. It's clear that's exactly what Leah wants, though, so I hop and stare out the window. This fucking town. I haven't been paying much attention to it in the past few days, being too infatuated w with Leo. Sure, I'd seen him some weird things, but it, it seems in my absence, everyone's gone to the fucking wacky shack. I look at Leo. Have you been noticing any of this weird shit going on? Leo sighs. Again, I never know what's weird or not here. I guess I've noticed a few things. I frown. Were you just hoping I wouldn't notice? Leo doesn't say anything, instead he just goes on staring at the kitchen. Would he really just let me blindly move to this town when he knew everyone was going crazy? Looking out the window, I notice a figure moving up the street, jogging. A feline. TJ? Is that Teach? Leo glances out the window. No, it's it's Clint. Looks like it. Out for a jog, of course. The wolf turns his attention back to the count as Janice comes out, a messy, a messy dribbling milkshake in her hand. Hey, Janice, what are you cooking back there? I glance up at the crazy coyote. She wobbles over to us, staring at the milkshake with wide eyes. Oh, you know, meat. Leo lets out a hollow laugh. <laughs> what kind of meat? I'll be honest with you. It's a bit tough and stringy. I lose interest in the conversation instead like a... I have a feeling that she killed someone. And she's serving it. But that's the kind of vibe that I'm getting right now. 
As rare it is that we ever see Janice, I am not liking her. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just do not like the vibes that she's giving out right now. I feel like something's off for sure. He's a ways away, but he looks kind of afraid. One of his hands reaches out to a bat to bat at something. What? Nah, no, this is definitely something up. Hi, Smooth23. How's it going? Welcome on in. Welcome to the Blep Pack. The Blep welcomes you. <laughs> Something's wrong. I mutter under my breath and start stand set on seeing set on getting out there to see what's going on with them. But at that point, a truck pulls into the parking lot right in front of our window. I find myself staring right at Duke. I also need something. I also see something big in the back of his pickup. A brown fur head, furred head peeking over the roof. Duke. Leo snaps his head over to look at the window. As if the weasel got out of his truck, I see something in his hand. A gun. Oh shit. Language, Leo. He's bringing in a gun. Leo reaches across the table for me. Not while I'm here. Janice! But she's already striding over to the door. It's just as Duke pushes through them. Chase, Chase, get down. Duke spots us immediately. I told you not to fucking run away from me! He's, he starts towards our table, but Janice on her way towards the kitchen intercepts him. Duke, is that a gun? I am not going to have you barging in here to ruin the peace. She, she sticks her bulky body in his way. Get the fuck out of my way, cunt. Language! It says if Janice doesn't notice that there's a fucking gun being waved around right next to her face. I reach out and grab Leo's arm, trying to pull him down. Call the police. My phone's dead. Leo slowly sits and looks around. The only exit is at the front. We're trapped. You don't think these fuckers are behind all of this? You've been seeing that auto around too, haven't you? I'm not concerned with that anymore. I made things right. You're not fucking concerned that what happened to our grandparents is happening to us? I won't ask you to leave again. Her voice is threatening. From this angle, I can't see her hands, but I can see she's reaching for something. Oh my god. Chase, Chase, get down. Leo's voice is bizarrely calm, but as he reaches over to me, I can feel him shake. He presses down on my shoulders. I'm about to slide under the table. I see Janice move towards then. Oh, shit. Leo shouts and yanks me from up against the side, covering me with his arms. I hear him breathe heavily into my ear, and I stare wide-eyed from under the booth only able to see the dirty beige wall opposite us. Leo's breathing is all I can hear, otherwise it's silent. Then I hear Duke muttering something under his breath, followed by soft padding footsteps. A few seconds later, his legs come into view and his feet turn to face us. I see the gun dangling from one hand before he raises it slightly, pointing it at us. I close my eyes. How did this happen? Just seconds ago, Leo and I were arguing, and now I'm about to fucking die. I keep my hands, eyes tightly closed, hugging to Leo as hard as I can and wait, but nothing happens. I keep my face pressed into Leo's chest, though, wondering if I'm already dead. Finally, Duke speaks. Leo, out. Otter, you stay there. I feel Leo hesitate against me, then his lips press against my ear. It'll, keep, it'll be okay, baby. Just, just stay here. No! Don't kill Leo! Face the wall. No, don't kill Leo! I ain't gonna fucking kill you. We're just figuring out what's happening is all. Killing you doesn't fix anything. Last guy got killed and that didn't fix shit. You shot Janice. Because she got in my fucking way. But it doesn't matter. Everything's fucked up now. Leo turns to face the wall slowly. I watch from the space between the table and the booth. What do you want? To fix this fucking town. You're starting something up with this otter. This all happened before. Duke looks out the window and makes a come on motion with his hand. We're going to stop it from happening this time. Leo looks to the left. But you fucking killed Janice. I hear the wolf's voice break slightly. It won't matter in the long run. The doors rattle as someone comes in. You got the zip ties? Hands behind your back, Leo. <gasps> no, 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 no. Come on. Now! Holy shit, you are fucking huge. I swallow hard as I watch Brian pull the zip tie tight. And Duke puts a forearm to his nose. Oh, fuck, you stink. Hope it didn't kill that ringtail. We could use him. Brian just grins in response, his teeth yellow. 
My heart stinks. My heart sinks as I think about Clint. Had he been wanting me to run? Why had I thought about him hanging from the tree like that it was probably just a normal thing for him and the bear? Was he a victim of whatever crazy? Was he a victim of whatever crazy has just hit the town? That must have been what was going on. All this is hitting at once. It can't be a coincidence. Clint was probably just as scared as I am now. Grab the otter and tie him up too. Just stick him in your trailer for now. My stomach drops. Duke gestures with his gun again. Come on. Out. My legs are lead. I can't move. Leo looks over his shoulder at me and the fear of his eyes scares me even more. His muzzle moves, mouthing something. Run. But still, I can't move and I've never been so scared in my life. It's like everything is numb. Brian doesn't care though and moves forward, the look on his face eager. The gun goes off again. Everyone including Brian jumps as I hit the floor with my hands over my head. Fuck! Fuck! I look up and see Duke, eyes extra wild, and dancing around pointing the gun upwards at the ceiling. Fuck, you see that? She's crawled around up there! I told you she's on my ceiling every night watching me! Brian's looking up to him for the first time, his face is twisted in an expression that isn't stupidly grinning. It's full of fear. But when I look up, I see nothing. Chase! Leo hisses at me and that jolts me back to reality. Without even willing myself to do it, I shoot out from under the table. In front of me are two exits, the front doors and the kitchen door, which is closer. There has to be an exit in the kitchen, but I'm not sure of that. My legs are already making me run though, and I have to choose now. Uh... Fuck, hold on, do we... Okay, good, we do have... Okay, so we have like eight pages of save slots that we can do. Good. Okay. Uh, you know what? The bottom, it always seems to be the bad ending. So we're going to go through the kitchen door. I have no idea how long Duke will be distracted. So I dive behind the counter for my closest exit. Don't look back, Chase. Go as fast as you can. Shit, shit. He's getting away, Brian. I push past the swinging door and immediately slip. One moment I'm standing and the next I'm laying on the ground, face stinging from the smackings of the tile. I stare blearily into the ground, forcing myself to move again, but it's still so slippery. At first I think the tiles are just red, but when the overpowering metallic scent hits my nose, I realize it's more than that. Blood is everywhere, and now I'm covered in it. I sob, wondering when the nightmare I'm in is going to end and when the paralysis will hit me. Fuck, fuck, get her off me! I force myself to move because I need to get the fuck out of here, dream or not. I slip and slide along the tile, trying to stand almost failing. I manage to grab the metal counter and yank myself up, and then I'm standing over the counter, and over what's on top of it. A pile of meat. I can see the fur, but it's a mount of unrecognizable parts. Butchered. Something cooks on the stove. My stomach turns as I heat, but there's nothing in, in me to come up. I bang- Holy shit, you're fucking huge! I bang behind me, forcing me to turn my right. I see the mount uh, mountainous form of Brian charge through the door. He slips immediately, but his momentum still takes him forward and reaches out for me. <coughs> Next thing I know is that I've been hit by a car and I'm flying back. I stop short of hitting the ground thanks to the wall behind me and my head explodes. The darkness that surrounds me is painful. I feel like I'm floating in a black scene and nothing about it is comforting or peaceful. It's like I'm, it feels like a fitful doze when you have a really bad fever. It feels awful and murky and sick. I feel my head tit tilt back and lightning bolts arc through my head. I try to open my eyes but they only manage to flutter and I see flashes of red above me. Something's hooked under my back and I'm dangling from it. I imagine a rope tied around me holding me above the dark abyss below. Is this hell? I grit my teeth as the searing red becomes too much to look at and I close my eyes again. This must be a nightmare, one that feels too real. I've had them before and I know how to deal with them. I just need to go back to sleep to drift off and I'll wake up in my bed. Go back to sleep and wake up the back in my dorm. Wait, an echo? I try to think, try to prod back in my memories. Why was I last? What was the thing that I remember doing? I'm trying to remember is monumental, more than I can handle, unfortunately, I drift back to the unconsciousness. I pull back to the sickly dark as something jolts my body. I grimace and gasp. I'm filled with such a feeling of unprovoked loneliness and despair that I actually feel my eyes watering with a sob that escapes my mouth. I hear a soft chuckle above me and I go quiet. I still don't know where I am or what's going on at all, but that laugh is enough to tell me that I don't want to be where I am. The feeling of hanging from a rope is gone now. Instead, I'm lying on something flat and hard on my arms and legs are spread out. 
The air is cool now, and my skin is cold and wet, like I've been sweating a lot. The feeling is especially strong along my back, and I want to roll over, but I can't. Something's holding my arms down, and there's a rattling sound when I try to move. I moan and try to open my eyes again, though it's almost like they're glued shut. With a little more effort, I manage to crack one eye open. At first, all I see is a blur of colors above me, and I have to blink a few times to clear it. Slowly, the image comes together, and I'm able to make out that someone's there above me. Holy shit. Dude, what the fuck? Dude, that is actually fucking creepy. Holy f What the f fuck just happened? Dude. Okay. That gave me major, major fucking chills. Like, my whole... Like, I know you guys can't see it, but my arms are shaking from that. Holy shit, dude. My my arms are literally shaking. Like I I can't even put them down. Holy fuck. Oh man, dude. I did, I did not like that. <laughs> I didn't like that in the slightest. I think that's like Oh my god. That, that caught me off guard. I I didn't like I thought freaking Carl's route was bad when they had that silhouette of him under the bed sheets, but holy fuck, dude! Oh boy. Okay, let's continue on with whatever the fuck just happened. I cringe as I see that same otter staring down at me, the otter that's clearly wearing the same clothes as I am. But now it's not smiling. A tear-stained expression on its face. It's a mirror. A mirror on the ceiling? I try to sit up, but I come short, gagging as something tightens around my neck. I try to move my hands to whatever it is, and that doesn't work either. The same rattling sound I heard earlier makes me look to my right hand, and what I see makes my blood freeze. Around my wrist is what looks like a leather strap. I desperately try to look at my other hand and find the same result. Looking at my feet, I see the same contraptions fixed to my ankles. When I try to lift one of my feet, I see metal glinting from underneath, making me think that the leather is bolted onto the platform. Panic rises up from my chest and I kick my feet and try to flail my hands, but the straps hold firm to what looks like wooden planks. Which is the platform that I'm laying on? They are arranged in a way to leave me spread at eagle. Over the leather, I can smell all kinds of musk. It's the strongest one that reminds me of Clint. I try to lift up my head, but the thing around my throat is too tight, and it instantly makes me choke again. My head throbs. Tears start to form in my eyes again as I try to think back. Where the fuck am I? Is this a prank of some kind? Maybe my friends at the dorm are trying to scare me. Had I been drinking at a party? No, wait, I'm an echo, and that's the last place I remember being. I'm here for a project, and I've been with my old friends. I was with Leo, and I'd been at the diner. Suddenly, all the horrible things that had happened that day come rushing back. Janice, Clint, Brian, the gun. Oh my god. 
that really happened? I struggle a bit more than try to think. I run to Leo's house. It's great. Very bittersweet. Leo, I don't even know what happened to him. I left with Duke. And then Brian, he'd been chasing me and he tried to break in. I started to breathe heavily as I realized where it might be. Brian got into the house where I was in Leo's room. He attacked me. I look around. I'm in a small room with what looks like a living room of some kind. There's a couch to my right with a wall and a clock on it to the left taken away. There's a window. There's a window too and along with the ticking, the wind blowing outside is the only other sound that I can hear. Looking down towards my legs, I can see what looks like a tiny kitchen with some cupboards and a countertop. Dishes and junk are piled high along the length of the counter and smells like cigarette smoke. Judging by the layout and size of the place, it looks like I'm in a trailer home. A small moan of terror escapes my lips. I'm in Brian's house. I remember Kud telling me that he lived in one. Tears start leaking out of my eyes again, even though the crying is making my head throb all over again. All I can think about what he was doing to Clint. No, no, I, I have to calm down. I don't want to attract any more attention if he's actually nearby. After what happened in the diner, the cops had to be on the way if they aren't already here. People eat in the diner all the time. Someone, one of my friends probably will find it and call someone. I just have to wait until they find me. I swallow again, feeling my body break down to a cold sweat all over again. What's going on? They wanted something from us. I remember that at least. But what? Duke had been saying something about seeing things and that we might be responsible. I squeeze my eyes shut and shake my head, but then immediately stop when my head drops from the movement. None of this makes any sense at all. Am I still dreaming? Imagine the smell of this, right? This whole place looks like a dump. Like, I don't know where they were at to, like, to take pictures of this and then, you know, like, have, like, this cut, sort of filter on it, but... Damn! <laughs> also, that freaking last moment with whatever that was, whatever reflection that was at us... Oh... I, I keep thinking about it because that just caught me so off guard. I can't get it out of my head now. I freeze and hold my breath. It's a little ways off, but I'm almost positive that's Duke. The high Weasley wine mixed with the occasional smoker's cough is unmistakable. It's coming closer and I can start to make out what he's saying. Because we're already fucked here. You think we could just let them go and it'll be all fine? I don't know who he's talking to, but by the sound of the accompanying heavy lumbering step gives me an idea. It'll be worth it though if we can figure out what the fuck is going on. It sounds like they're right up against the trailer now. I can hear them walking around it towards the small door on the right side of the kitchen. Leo ain't saying shit yet, but I think it might be an otter. It might be the otter. He's the one I seen last week. The footsteps stop in front of the door and I listen to my heart. My I listen hard, my heart pounding in my chest. Hope you haven't done anything to him. I didn't. Brian's uncharacteristically high-pitched voice sends a chill up my spine, my fur flaring out with it. You bet your ass you haven't. If you do any of your fucked up shit to him. I stop breathing, staring at my terrified expression in the mirror. What I'm saying is that we've got a chance to get out of this. What we've done is bad enough, but if we can get him to understand... They stop talking, and that's when I can hear Brian's heavy labored breathing. I'm not breathing at all, worried that they might be able to hear it, even though they already know I'm here. I let out with a gasp as the door suddenly swings open and Duke comes up the steps, looking around before spotting me. Brian, you are one sick fuck. I tense up as a massive shadow appears behind him and it feels like the entire trailer tips a bit as Brian makes his way up the same steps. Brian's presence is so imposing and frightening that I don't even notice that Duke is, is now right next to, him, to me. I jump when he sets the hand on my left arm. I jerk my head to look at him, wide-eyed. Hey, hey, calm down. We ain't gonna hurt you. Brian chuckles and Duke shoots him a look. He turns at his attention. He turns his attention back to me, softening his expression, at least as much as he can with his scraggly, drug-fucked face. We just need to get some information from you. I open my mouth to speak, but all that comes out is a dry squeak. Brian chuckles again and makes his way to stand to my right. I cringe away from him in a stench of old sweat as he grins down at me with his yellow teeth. Brian, get some fucking water. Brian looks at Duke with a strange face before turning back to the kitchen. Hey, don't worry about him. I know this thing. Duke taps one of the boards with a finger. Looks bad, but we're gonna hold you here for a bit. He's a queer. He likes it. Duke glares at him as Brian comes back from the kitchen with a ceramic mug. 
You're queer too. Brian visibly bristles as his face loses any of the sick humor it once had. Duke clears his throat. <clears> Thing. <throat> Things have been happening here, and we want to find out why. What? Duke froze his brows like a kid trying to figure out something difficult. See, people ain't We're right in the head here. No shit. Duke seems to immediately read my thought process before he holds up his hands and shakes his head. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, we're doing ain't exactly right in the head either. Brian gives his dumb chuckle again, but I keep my face averted from him, partly because I really can't stand the smell. But we're all a little fucked up here. What I'm talking about is something else. Like what you saw with Janice. I shift a little as I'm reminded about what happened in the diner. Is she dead? Duke looks genuinely sad. I don't know. And it's a damn shame. But you saw the way she came at me. That's the shit I'm talking about. I look back at the weasel's waistband and immediately see the handgun tucked in his pants there. And I was hoping to stop before any of this happened. But now... Everything's gone to shit. Brian finishes for him and I can feel him move close to the platform I'm laying on. Again, I avoid eye contact, not wanting to provoke him in any way. Yep, and it's only gonna get worse. Duke just looks at me like it's all the information that I need. I I don't know what you're talking about. I see a twitch of irritation on Duke's face and I hold my breath. I mean, what's happening out there? Duke shakes his head. What's happening everywhere? It wasn't just Janice that lost her mind. Duke looks back at the window suddenly, his fur standing on end. I look too, but all I see are leaves and branches, the late afternoon sun filtering through them. Duke's quiet for a while before he starts speaking out again without turning a word. Without, uh, never without, without, without turning around. Why am I, why do I suck at pronouncing words today? And why do I suck at reading words today? It happened to my granddaddy, my daddy, and now it's happening to me. I close my eyes, wondering if Duke is just as crazy as Janice was. If he does, I doubt he'll, he even has a clue of what he's doing right now. Dale's missing. Cynthia drove off into the desert. Duke turns around to look back at me. We saw your cat friend running down the street on the way here, saying something that's after him. So I was TJ. Thing is, we've all got something after us. Something bad. We'll never leave when it starts. What's after you? I flinch as Brian speaks just above me, leaning down towards my face. I, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Bullshit! I flinch again as Duke's concerned demeanor immediately drops away. Why do you think we get we came to get Leo and you? He pauses like I should actually know the answer. I feel myself starting to panic again with these two crazy hillbillies looming over my body. I I I don't know what. Duke slaps me and I grasp it and I gasp in shock. I saw you hanging around with this fucking town before you got here late at night lurking around. I'm still cringing from the slap as I keep my eyes closed. As if not seeing any of this is going to make it stop. Now once all your friends get here, all hell breaks loose. You think that's a fucking coincidence? It's quiet for a moment and all I can hear is the rush of blood in my ears. Is this really happening? I feel Duke touch my arm again and I flinch in fear. Hey. I feel like he wants me to look at him so I slowly open my eyes, tears spilling out as I do. The blurry shape of Duke dances in front of me. I'm not saying you did it or that you wanted it to happen. I don't say anything because I still don't know what he's talking about, but I know that I can't tell him that. It's just that you gotta know something, anything, so that we can stop this. Duke starts to pat my arm in a shiver. Brian is breathing heavily next to me and glances at him, shows that his expression is more interested now, almost eager. Duke still hasn't answered my question. It makes no sense that they go so far as to kidnap us. But why, why didn't you just ask us? Why all, why all this? I lift my hands weakly, making the platform rattle. Duke's face darkens. Because I've been asking Leo all week what the fuck you guys are doing, and he wouldn't say shit. Duke stops petting my arm and scratches behind his head. And, uh, my, uh, someone, something, someone told me that you would know. I stare at him. Who? Someone I know, and it makes sense. Something bad happens, and if you don't fix it, it won't stop coming after you. Is that, like, the thing that he's talking about? Like... The thing that we saw in that mirror, that really, really, like, really creepy version of us. Maybe that's what's coming after us? Says they know, and I thought it had to be Leo, are you considering what we've seen these past few weeks? Duke pauses, or maybe just one of your other friends. My mind briefly flashes to DJ. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I wait for another slap, but it doesn't come. 
I opened my, my, my eyes again and Duke is looking back out the window. We're kind of protecting you too. I stared at the back of his head. Things are getting worse out there, and if we don't figure something out soon, we're all going to die. Duke's voice is dead and distant. Brian, though, touches my other arm in a gas, sh shrinking away. He's smirking down at me, looking down at my stomach, or, well, crotch, or whatever it might be. Brian, stop. Duke has turned back around, looking over at me at the bear. We're not getting anywhere right now, and I gotta get back to the wolf. Even though Duke is the one that hit me, I'm terrified of the thought of being left alone with Brian. Duke sees my face. Don't worry, Chase. Even though you're lying to us, I don't plan to let this pervert have his way with you. Brian snorts. Brian knows what will happen if he does. Duke gives Brian a cold call his stare, and this time Brian doesn't give a stupid grin back. But you better hope your fuck buddy says something soon, because if not, we might have to get mean. Duke heads for the door, running, turning over to look at his shoulder. Just feed him and make sure he doesn't escape. That's it. And with that, Duke briskly disappears out the door, a golden flash of afternoon light lighting up the dim trailer. Brian and I listen to the weasel's soft, anxious footsteps recede into the distance. As soon as the sound is gone, Brian stands up. I turn my head in time to see him whirl around and smash his fist into the wall. I jump as much as I can in my restraints before he does it again, this time slamming both of his fists into the wall. Fucking faggot! He screams so loudly that my ears immediately start ringing. I think he's talking to me, so I brace myself for what I'm sure is going to be the worst moment of my life. But he stalks right past me, not even looking at me. Instead, he strides up to the kitchen counter. Once there, he picks up a dirty pan that raises it over his head before bringing it down with a crash. I hear glass shatter before he does it again and again. Goddamn cucksucking piece of shit! Damn! Chill out, dude! He throws the pan across the room to crash the, to crash into the wall. I'll fucking kill him! I'll kill that fucking cunt! I stare at him, my eyes were wide as I watch him stamp his feet like a little kid. Then he slaps himself across the face twice. After that, he closes his hand into a fist and punches himself in the head repeatedly. That's with the force that he would knock that would knock me out cold. It might be funny if I wasn't tied down to a contraption in a trailer belonging to Brian. Brian stumbles after what seems like the fifth blow and covers his face. His massive shoulders shake with sobs. Thanks. Thinks he can do whatever the fuck he wants. Thinks he can boss me around. And Brian whirls around and slams both his fists onto the counter several more times. The sound of shifting glass accompanying it. I'll kill him, kill him, kill him! His voice crescendos in pitch and volume before he finally slumps against the counter and his hand, head in his hands as he starts crying again. I breathe as quietly as I can, not wanting to draw any attention to myself. I'll, I'll get him. I'll fucking get him. He won't control me no more. Suddenly, his quaking shoulders freeze. Suddenly, he turns, and with a sinking heart, I realize he's looking right at me. The fur on his cheeks, already matted before, are now flat and shiny with wet. Snot runs from his nose down to his upper lip. Then I see red dripping from his left fist. The fur on the right is matted with blood as well. He watches me for a while, then grins. Am I funny to you? I open my mouth, but nothing comes out. He suddenly strides up to the, right out to the end of the platform, standing between my spread legs. I feel numb. The fear taking up every fiber of my being. I feel nothing else. You like seeing him make fun of me? I try to speak again, but still nothing comes out. I swallow. N no? My lips tremble and my voice shakes. I never stuttered so hard in my life. You know what I'd do to you if I could? Brian sneers down at me, the wet fur in his cheeks bristling out. I swear to God, I... Fucking tear your balls off right fucking now. Ugh. Yeah. Eee. Please. Brian's grin only gets bigger. Uh, Good, you already know how to beg. Moving his hands to clap over. And then it hang you for hours. I stare at This man is freaking sick. Gross. At least buy me dinner or something. And I give him a little still to stand on when you start to go and then kick it away again. He stares at me hard and then I can feel his crotch grinding up against mine. He's and he blinks away and slowly pulls back. He watches me and gasps and sob for a while before reaching down again. I try to turn my head away, letting out a moan of terror, but he doesn't grab my neck again. Instead he prods and teases the fur, checking the skin on my neck. 
Better not bruise the fucking cocksucker saw that. His expression darkens again. If you fucking tell Duke about this? He raises a fist and I cringe. No, 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 I, won't, I swear! I turn my head away, eyeing his raised fist. He holds it there for a while, watching me. He seems to be calculating something, like he's wondering if he can get away with what he's about to do. Then he seems to make up his mind. Good. With that, he slams his fist down right into the center of my torso. Ow! My vision flashes and I hear rasping, droning wheeze that I realize is coming out from my mouth. It goes on and on until there's no air left in me and then I can't breathe in again. My vision goes black as I suffocate, rising against the restraints, wanting to curl up into a little ball and disappear. It feels like hours and days before I finally get a sip of air. My mouth gapes as I try to suck it in faster. Brian is standing over me and I'm somehow surprised that he's got a worried look on his face. He probably thinks he kills me, but then my stomach starts to turn and lurch. Before I even realize I'm about to puke, a gush of vomit fills my mouth and I start to choke. Oh shit! Brian hurries to my side as I'm giving him a second heave and mixed with a gag. He tips the platform over sideways. His huge paw pushes my face to the side and I look at the ground and watch it spills to the ugly shag carpet. What the f- Oh man, that just painted a really, really bad picture in my head. At this point, I'm too tired to cry. Instead, I lay there in a daze, occasionally hacking or coughing. Brian goes to the kitchen, rustling around a while before returning with water and paper towels. He wipes my face and nose before tilting my head up to drink the water. Rinse and spit. He holds the mug there until I do as he says, then he gets down to his knees. I watch his head bob up and down as he busies himself with the mess on the floor, muttering about Duke finding out. I'm too numb to really care about that right now, though. Right now, I'm starting to realize that I might not survive this. Brian calms down pretty quick after his tantrum. Once he cleans up the mess, he splays out onto the couch and starts watching TV. It's some kind of cartoon about a pink cat, and he actually laps along with the juvenile jokes. Pink Panther? Oh, look at him! Look at us! While this goes on, I lay quietly against my platform, trying not to start crying again. My mind keeps wandering back just hours ago, how everything seemed fine for the most part. I keep wishing I could just go back to the beginning of this week. Thinking about how that makes me sentimental about longing to see Leo, TJ, Carl, Jenna, and even Flynn again. Where are they all right now? Dick said some things are bad out there. Are they all, are they all in some sort of trouble? If that's the case, the cops should be here by now. Someone would have gotten the word out, wouldn't they? If people were murdering each other, like what happened to Janice, then there's no way that would be the case. Brian lets out another explosive laugh, wiggling his feet on the arm to rest of the couch. Earlier, he tried to feed me some dried cereal, but it was like cardboard in my mouth, and only after a handful, I couldn't eat anymore. I'm just thankful that he's preoccupied with something else right now. There's a soft knock at the door, and Brian jumps, quickly changing the channel to golf before he sets up and lumbers over to the door. He pauses, then rifles through some magazines on a small table next to the couch. He pulls out a handgun that looks cartoonishly small in his hands before making his way to the door. I weakly turn my head in his direction and watch Brian open the door a crack. He chuckles. Well, it's going to shit, and you're still coming down for more. Eh? Oh, it's not the reaction I was expecting. I mean, but look at us, though. Like, the poor boy is just... Like, I, I just want to give him a big hug. I just want to free him and just give him a big hug. <laughs> He's just, like, so sad. And Leo, too. I don't know what they've done with their boy Leo. Clinton's looking like looking up at Brian, appearing even more disheveled than usual. So are we doing? Clint had stepped up onto the first step and looked into the trailer, immediately spotting me. He stares, the shock in his face almost comical. Brian turns to see what he's looking at as if he'd forgotten I was even there. He gives a start before shoving Clint back out the door. Um, uh, I'm full today. I already got someone taking your spot. Clint's now out of my line of sight, but I hear him shuffling around the dead vegetation. Please, I really need something right now. We can do it outside. There's a moment of silence as Brian seems to comp contemplate that. No, no. I got some business to take care of. Tomorrow, maybe. Clint starts to whine again, but Brian swings the door shut with a bang. <laughs> Fucking dopehead. Brian walks back to the room, looking at me, then back at the TV. Probably shouldn't have let him see you, though. He mumbles before sitting back down and switching the channel back to the cartoon. I stare up at my reflection. 
Even from here, I can see that my eyes are bloodshot, and the fur on my face is matted. There are dark spots on my shirt, too, and I distantly wonder if Brian had broken ribs when he punched me. Then I remembered that his hand had been bleeding when he did that. I feel strange now. Numb. It feels kind of good after a whirlwind of emotions I had earlier. I still haven't caught up to everything that's happened since I was in that diner. Would I ever be able to? Would I ever have time if Brian planned it? Ginger panic pierces through my fog of desiccation and I clench my eyes shut, screwing up my face as I try to not start crying again. Brian snorts again, something on the TV. I open my eyes to the distraught otter laying on the wooden tor torture contraption. Why is there a mirror on your ceiling? I surprised myself a little by asking the same question. Apparently, I really didn't give a fuck about this point. I see Brian look over me from my peripheral vision. Heh, you really want to know? I shrug the best I can, continuing to stare passively up at the ceiling. The movement sends electric tingles to my arms, which are completely numb at this point. Well, Brian shifts around the couch as he tries to get a better look at me. When I has my fun, I like him to see what I'm doing. Uh, I stare up at the ceiling, my expression is still blank. I mean, it's not just about what I'm feeling, what they're feeling is more important too. So he's a masochist. That's sick. That is actually sick. That is disgusting. That is creep. Sure, it can choke you all you want and cut you all at once, but when I do that, you're not thinking about what's actually happening. Brian shifts into a sitting position, not more interested in our conversation than his cartoons. I realize now I probably made a mistake. Want to see? No, 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 no. Do not do a single thing. Brian gets up anyway and comes around to stand over me above my head, blocking my view of the mirror. His reeking stench fills my nostrils, but still, I try not to give him the satisfaction of seeing how afraid I am starting to become. His massive hands reach out around my head and start to fiddle with something I can't see. With one quick motion, the strap comes back down over my neck and my eyes widen. I grip my teeth and try to press my head as hard as I can into the platform behind my head to lessen the strain. It's not a lot of pressure, but it's enough to make me want to gag. A sadist and a masochist. That's what this dude is. He likes the fear, and he likes the pain. That is disgusting. Brian chuckles again. See, you're probably only thinking about how it's hard to breathe right now. Just trying to figure out how to make it stop, but... Brian leans back, revealing a terror-stricken otter to the ceiling, his eyes bulging and his teeth bared. Now you see what's happening to you. Your brain telling you, yeah, this is really fucking happening. The leather squeaks a little as he pulls it down tighter. I start to writhe at this point, seeing my tongue sticking out and face get a mask of horror. You feel more, and that's what I like. Brian comes back into my vision. His expression is different. He's really searching my face now like he's looking for something. Maybe you like it too. No! With the final squeak of leather, Brian lets go and I gasp hungrily for air. Brian pats my head while I cough, inhaling shakily. <laughs> Don't exaggerate, that was nothing. He moves away and slumps back into the couch, pulling out his crotch. Your buddy Clint gets it way worse. I choose not to stare at the, at the choking otter on the ceiling and instead look out the window, feeling the fresh tears roll down my face. I'm not sure if it's from the choking or the black hole in my chest. I watch the leaves rustling at the wind and think about where the others are and why no one's come to help me. Series means you enjoy flicking. Oh wait, yeah, that's right. I'm stupid because masochist is like, you're you're the one feeling it, but the sadist is the one that's giving it. But exactly, that's still fucked up. That is disgusting. That is actually disgusting. But, to be fair, they do paint you a really good picture, and that's why this novel is freaking awesome. Like, it's disturbing, and it's really creepy, but that's actually what I'm starting to like a bit, is like, I'm starting to like, like, these sort of, like, disturbing kind of scenes where, you know, like, it really messes with your head. I turn my head back to the ceiling. The blank expression has returned. Brian continues to chuckle at his cartoons, and despite myself, I ask another question. Have you ever killed someone? 
the first time, Brian ignores me. I don't say anything for the rest of the day. I say Brian represents the most horrible non-supernatural elements uh, of the town. Yeah, I'm starting to get that vibe too. I stare into the darkness, the only faint source of light coming from the moonlight moonlit leaves with, through the window. It's been less than 24 hours since I've been kidnapped. Still, it makes no sense that someone hasn't found me. Is what Duke said about the town true? I wonder what Leo's doing right now if what he's going through is just as bad. I doubt it is. At least Duke seemed slightly less unhinged. I give a soft trembling sigh, my head still throbbing from today's events. The thunderous snoring from Brian has literally shaken the platform I'm on, and though I'm drifted off a few times, I can't sleep. He's right next to me, his stained couch apparently doubling his, uh, as his bed. I shift around on the contraption for what feels like the hundredth time, trying to get comfortable when I feel something. There's more, to, there's more give in my right arm than I remember. In fact, it's incredible. It's incredibly loose. I pause, then experimentally wiggle my arm around before easily pulling my hand out from the- Oh! I freeze, disbelieving, not wanting to believe in case this isn't true somehow. Painfully, I crane my neck to look at my right arm. Though it's dark, I can see that my arm is clearly free, and my elbow on the board, my hand in the air. I swallow hard, listening to Brian's snores again to make sure he's actually asleep. I try to keep my breathing even, not wanting to make any more sound than I needed to, but I'm almost sobbing with relief at this point. Now I'm able to partially sit up and make short work of the left arm restraint. Fully sitting up now, I do away with the final two ankle restraints and slide off the table quietly. Okay, hold on. Let me save here real quick. Wait. We made a save. We made a save slot already, right? Okay, yeah, we did. That we'll have to come back to later and see if that's anything different. Because there's four choices that we have now. Brian is still snoring at full volume and covers up to what little sound I make. Making my way over to the messy floor, I find the steps and try not to stumble down them to open the door. Incredibly, there's no squeaking or rattling as I do, and before I know it, I'm outside in the cool air. I run through the woods and onto the road, sobbing with joy now as I see Leo's house. The lighting, the lights are on and I'm running towards it like a... I think I even see Carl's horns through the window. Wait, where is Leo though? We need to know where Leo is at. Leo! Carl! I got out! Open the door! I try the handle and it opens, swinging inward to the blackness. I stare, trying to comprehend. You really fell for that? I hear my... Instead, it's higher pitch like I'm hearing it from a video recording rather than my own throat. Then I'm sucked into the blackness and slammed hard back down into a wooden plat... Ah! All at once, I realize what happened and my heart feels like it drops in my chest. Of course. A dream. I'm back in the hot, stifling trailer. It looks even darker than I did in my dream. That's mean! That's really mean! I close my eyes and start to cry quietly. It feels like I've just been found out that I've locked up in the cycles trailer all over again. I turn my head and look out the window above Brian, longing for some daylight. And then I see two white eyes set against, uh, set against a black face staring back in at me. And I jump. What the fuck? Am I just dreaming? Then I see the two beige colored ears above the head. Kudzu? I gasp again, quieter. I'm overcome with relief once again, but the fear that I'm still dreaming is almost overpowering it. I wave my hand, left hand as much as I can, but I'm not sure he can see it. I realize that none of the light from the window is falling on me. Kudzu moves to the side, then back again, squinting, clearly trying to see inside. I think about making a noise, calling out his name, but I have no idea how deep of sleep Brian is. As if on cue, Brian gets a lot of snow and rolls over. Kudzu seems to have heard it, his big ears perking before he ducks down. My heart hurts just losing the sight of him, and I strain at my bonds. Brian seems to be waking up, though mumbling something in his sleep. No, no, you're dead. I pull with my right arm again, in case my dream had been onto something, and it doesn't budge. <sighs> Fucking cunt. Brian's really starting to kick around now, his massive form rolling over on the stomach, rubbing his face into the pillow. He starts to make loud gasping noises as he gets. Uh, he starts to make loud gasping sounds as he gets to his knees and onto the bed. Back off! He holds his hands up, snarling. You're dead. You're dead! I stare at him, almost forgetting about Kudzu. His eyes are open and they snap at me. His hands are still out. No, no. His face is etched with horror. His eyes are wide and white in the darkness. 
He backs up against the back of the couch as he continues to stare. I continue to stare back at him, unsure of what he's going to do. After about 10 seconds, his expression starts to melt from horror to confusion. I continue to stare back, bracing for another explosion from him for whatever reason. His shoulders droop again and frowns at me. What? Did, did he see her? My mouth is dry, so I have to swallow a few times before I can answer. Who? Brian doesn't respond and starts to look around the trailer. I see Kutsu starting to poke his head up again. At this point, I made it up my mind that I want to escape tonight. I'm not going to spend another minute with this maniac. Making a decision that could mean life or death suddenly is terrifying and exhilarating. exhilarating. I don't give myself time to think about it. Brian? He doesn't answer. Starting to look up around. Brian, I have to go to the bathroom. Brian sighs as he flips on the light. Kutsu drops out of view again. Brian heaves a huge sigh before turning to the counter. He reaches for a pan and dumps out some murky water into the sink. I wrinkle my nose. He shrugs at me. What? This'll do. No, I have to use a toilet. My stomach's feeling really bad right now. Brian turns and really looks at me. Like what? You gotta puke? I shift down the platform. No, I, I think I have diarrhea. Brian pulls a look of extreme disgust, which is kind of funny for someone who's apparently never showers. Oh, come on. He glares at me like it's my fault that I might be sick. He looks around a while, then back down at the pan. The bear seems to quickly disregard the idea and sets it back down on the counter. He comes over next to me and starts to undo the restraints. If you try anything... No, I promise. I just really need to go. Brian grumbles as he starts to roughly undo my restraints. I take care not to look at his crotch as it's pressing uncomfortably close to my face. As he pulls my right arm out, I gasp in shock and pain. It feels like a million needles are poking through it as he pushes my arm down. How hard did he tie us down? Holy crap! Wait, 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 fuck! Brian pauses as he watches me grimace in pain and I worry he's getting off on it. At that moment, though, there's some rustling next to the window as I try to groan it over. Oh, fuck. The bear looks at me bewildered and annoyed. What? Now my dream seems to be even more ridiculous that I've so easily been able to run off. Everything's falling asleep. Just take it slower. Brian sighs even louder and gets to work on my left arm anyway. This time he doesn't yank my arm out though and lets me slowly move it on my own. It's not nearly as bad as my right arm, which is still violently tingling, but I have to grip my teeth as I move it to the rest of my chest. Luckily, my legs are fine and I'm able to move them easily after Brian takes them out. It makes me worry about what I'm going to try since I'm not nearly as strong as I should be. Brian is clearly on guard as he tries to help me set up from the contraption, keeping his distance as he holds onto my arm. <coughs> Excuse me. I sit there a moment, letting the circulation return back to my limbs as I try to not fall over the dizziness. Brian finally gives a growl of annoyance and pulls me off the wooden platform. I realize this is the only moment I have to make my move. There's nothing nearby for me to grab, so instead I swing with everything I have to smash my fist up against the side of Brian's face. Something cracks in my hand and pain runs up in my arm. I gasp and cringe as Brian grunts. Brian's paws slowly brings his hand up to feel the side of his face. I guess I'd hope for that I'd be able to knock him out with one punch. But doing that as an otter to a bear, especially a bear like Brian, would have to be quite the feat. Brian does seem stunned though, and that's all I need to take in a huge breath and scream as loud as I can. Kutu! Brian whirls on me, swinging his fist along with them. I duck immediately, covering my head with one arm, the other still locked in Brian's grasp. He only partially misses, his fist catching the top of my head and my arm. It knocks me to the ground and sit there in a daze. I don't have long to collect myself because Brian is pulling a foot back to kick me. Shut up! I roll to the side and start to back away while I'm crouched, but Brian yanks me up by my arm and my head jerking back with the force. Now I'm starting to wonder if Kudzu ended up leaving. If that's the case, then I'm definitely dead because there's no way I'm going to break his grasp. As I'm thinking this, the door bangs open. Brian is in the middle of drawing his fist back when it happens and he freezes, looking over at the door. Kutsu stands there, his eyes wide behind his black mask, chest heaving. He's scared, I can tell, but Brian's shock gives me the opening that I was looking for. I reach in between his legs and grab his balls. Weirdly enough, the first thought I have is about how fucking big it is. It takes both my hands to wrap around it fully, and when I do, I twist and yank them down as hard as I can. I pour all my fear and anger into the attack, snarling as I do. I screw that Brian lets us a high pitch, I feel like every glass in the trailer is gonna explode. You know, good call. Good call. This attack is all I have left, so when the re his retaliation comes, I don't do anything to defend myself. Luckily, it's not a punch or kick, but rather he grabs the front of my back of my head along with my shirt and tries pulling me back. 
My face stretches as I stubbornly hold on and just yank down even harder. His sack is stretched and distorted so badly it's barely even recognizable as balls. His screaming suddenly cuts off with the sound of a deep, sickening smack. Immediately, Brian's body crumples onto me as he falls onto his hands and knees. It happens in a way that he's splayed over me, his face inches from mine. I have to smell his gag-inducing breath before the sound happens again. This time, I see Kutsu swinging something down hard from overhead and Brian's head jolts. I watch as his eyes lose their focus on me and he slumps down. I turn my head sideways as he comes down to rest on my body, crushing the air from my lungs. Kutsu is there immediately and pushes Brian's body aside to the point of being able to pull me out. He pulls me into a sitting position next to him. Hey, are you okay? He's shaking and I can hear his ragged breath in my ear. The contrast between being engulfed in Brian's stench to smelling Kutsu's shampooed fur and peppermint breath is striking. I can't speak and instead I lean against Kutsu and wrap my arms around him as I sob. Kutsu holds me as he looks at me over. Can you walk? I nod silently as I press my face into the fur on the shoulder. Alright, come on. We can't stay here. He stands slowly, keeping me in the embrace as he guides me towards the door. I don't remember much about the walk back to Kutsu's house aside from the stilted flashes of dirt and sagebrush. It's dark, hot, and my shirt immediately starts to stick to my sweaty fur. My legs are so numb that I don't even know if I'm moving them right. Kutsu has to hold on to me the entire way so I don't fall over. Crickets chirp all around us, but every few minutes I hear shouting and screams in distance. I turn to look over my shoulder to see if Brian is coming after us, but Kutsu grunts and tells me to keep watching my steps. Some circulation has returned to my legs, and I'm able to at least match Kutsu's stride over the uneven dirt road. Still, it, it feels like a thousand needles are stabbing up my feet and legs and waves with every step that I take. I'm genuinely afraid I'm going to wake up any second and find myself still stuck in Brian's shirt. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I don't know what it is with me today. I keep coughing, and that's actually the first burp I've got, which, again, I apologize. None of this seems real. I'm still watching my feet and the ground, so I don't notice how could Kutsu's house until I almost kicked the bottom step to his rusty trailer. Just the sight of the trailer sending chills up my spine, even though Brian's trailer looks very different compared to Kutsu's. We stand in the front of his door for a while as the raccoon fishes through his pockets for his keys. It's made it extra it's made extra difficult with me hanging on him. I can I can stand on my own if you got it. Kutsu whips out a small gold colored key before sliding it into the lock. Once we're inside, Kutsu immediately kicks the door and cl closed behind us before reaching back to turn to the deadlock. The inside of Kutsu's trailer is the opposite of its exterior. This actually looks pretty nice. It's brightly lit and tidy. Nothing like Brian's place. It's a little cramped as any trailer would be, but the furniture is arranged neatly and the kitchen is spotless. Everything looks way newer than the trailer on is on the outside. I imagine the raccoon did a lot of work to get it to look like this. Kutsu quickly guides me to a small love seat and makes, his, and makes as if to lay me down. I put a hand on his chest, feeling my stomach turn. Wait, I think I'd rather sit up. Do you need anything? Food? Or a drink? Kutsu's looking into my eyes with dark, with his dark browns. The brows above him furrowed into a deep concern. I nod slowly as, uh, so as to not upset my stomach again. Just water, please. Sure. Kutsu quickly hurries off to the kitchen and I slowly lean into the cushions behind me. I'm not tired at all, but I feel numb, and not just physically. My arms stop as if they feel like the leather straps are still bound in around my wrists. It even feels like they're being pulled off by an invisible force. Like if I relax, my arm... Hold on, you guys, I'll be right back.
Okay, yo, so I'm actually gonna have to end stream here because I gotta go somewhere. So, I'm just gonna save. We're just gonna, we're just gonna leave the game. And uh, I would have liked to stream a bit longer, but I actually need to go somewhere. So, uh, I don't think we'll be raiding anyone tonight. So, take care, everyone. I'll see you all soon.